welcome everyone to the Rare Books and Special Collections Thursdays at 3 series talk. We are delighted that uh, you are all here to support Carolyn and hear this wonderful talk that she has, um, that she has crafted. Uh, so I'm very pleased to welcome Carolyn Coons to speak on the topic of broadside ballads. She has a very, very exciting, a uh, really interesting topic, and I think uh, uh, has a lot of uh, really neat crossovers with uh, with our division, but several other sort of subject areas at the library as well, which is very exciting to think about where this research could go, uh, certainly uh, in the future also. So just a little bit about Carolyn, not that um, I have to say too much, because we have so much support from her family that's here, which is very nice. <laughs> um, but, for, uh, but for everyone else, uh, Carolyn received her MA in Communication Studies at Baylor, uh, in 2015, uh, her thesis was entitled The Battle Hymn of the Republic's Rhetorical Evolution. So Carolyn is currently uh, a doctoral candidate at Penn State and a fellow at the Center for Democratic Deliberation uh, through the McCourtney Institute for Democracy. So very impressive. Uh, her research focuses on the intersection of ancient Greek rhetoric, sonic rhetoric, and American public address. Uh, her dissertation, tentatively titled Composing American Harmony, exam uh, examines harmony as civic and musical concepts through American history. The research explores how songs like Yankee Doodle and Hail Columbia and many more not only distance Americans from their sort of British colonial identity, but functioned as an educational resource uh, for post-war populations that were actively defining what it meant to be American, right? So very, uh, very interesting topic. So we're delighted that Carolyn is here uh, to, to uh, speak with us, to share this research. Uh, so please help me in welcoming Carolyn to the Library of Congress. Thank you all for coming out and spending your lunch hour or just free time you had uh, hearing about this first chapter of my dissertation. Um, I want to especially thank Michael North and everyone here at the Library of Congress who has coordinated this event. It's been several months of planning and here it all is. Um, I'd also like to thank the College of Liberal Arts at Penn State for funding my trip here and the Center for Democratic Deliberation who made it possible to come visit the archives back in October that created the foundation of this presentation. So I'd like to thank all of you for that. Think of a song. Sing it inside your head. Hum the first line. Now add lyrics. Melodic lines form the root of a song. Then lyrics add accompaniment. Without the musical dimension, songs are simply poetics. And even when read silently, it can be difficult to divorce lyrics from their melodious accompaniment. That is not to diminish the role of poetics as rhetoric's productive pair, but to attend to that connection between suasion and sonority in democracy. Patriotic songs are one of the rhetorical situations in which that rhetoric poetics tie is prominently featured. My argument in this chapter and in this presentation is simply that songs matter to democratic spaces. They write together a poetic and memorable touchstone that connects together civic duty and shared values. The constitutive rhetoric of nationalist lyrics composes multiple shared identities, all of which lend themselves to a sense of civic duty. Songs lend themselves to both oral and written forms of circulation. They don't necess necessitate literacy to be shared between individuals. Songs bridge individual participation and communal listening and memor excuse me, memorable melodies invite earworms to reinvigorate reminders of lyric argument. The collaboration of sonic and symbiotic are one of the conditions that craft what I term civic harmony. So the approach I take in my research is one of rhetoric. I'm a communication scholar uh, who takes the look of rhetoric. And this is not rhetoric as you hear in the news meaning empty words. This is an art that goes back to Aristotle, at least, probably further, and is continuing to develop, to develop over time. So the Aristotle definition of rhetoric is the faculties of discovering, in any case, all the available means of persuasion. For a definition that has been updated more than a couple millennia, uh, <laughs> Thomas Farrell 
defines things as rhetoric is the art, the fine and useful art of making things matter. That's pretty simple. So my twist on things is to take rhetoric as an approach to studying music, particularly American music, and how it helps civic identity fit together. How do songs help us to be better Americans, inform what an American is, all of it together. So I take the musical metaphor of harmony, which can mean a number of things. And when we hear it in discourse, th what got me started on this project was the term racial harmony. Racial harmony can mean a lot of things, but often when said by a white body, it means to diminish rather than to add variety. And harmony in the musical sense requires multiplicity. So if you look on the side closest to me, we have chords that are structured. You've got multiple notes being played at the same time, and they change over time. And they can be built in a number of ways. It creates something either beautiful or very dissonant. So this movement and complement of multiplicity is where I'm going with the harmonic metaphor. So the civic harmony is taking this multiplicity in music and bringing it into how we think of individuals and groups of people all building into the same discourse. With harmony comes its oppositional pair of dissonance, that which doesn't get along. Karma Chavez is a rhetorician who writes of dissonance as critique that connotates something moving towards completion and something potentially, though not inherently, very displeasing. All above, though, dissonance produces the energy and anxieties that often instigate movement to some other place. That movement is what drives us forward as a group, as a nation. At least that's what I'm arguing. It's harmony as well as dissonance that moves forward. And you can't have harmony without having the passage of time. There's no momentary harmony. There has to be that movement. That's at least where I'm going with it. And the place I've started for this is the ballad. So ballads are often thought of as a dying art. They peaked with the troubadour and have just kind of fallen by the wayside since. George Malcolm Laws, he's a scholar of balladry, argues that since this 18th century, practically every ballad editor has felt called upon to say a few nostalgic words about the good old days when balladry flourished. And he's arguing the opposite, that ballads are still around. They still do wonderful things. They just need to be analyzed, talked about, interpreted, and in order to advance the folk song as a genre and a component of American discourse. <laughs> I can see Jean DeHart nodding. Um, a ballad that you may or may not be familiar with, this is slightly more recent than the time period my talk is addressing, but I want you to be able to identify a ballad before we go into analyzing them in print. There's a story told in the Appalachians that Tom Dula, a soldier in the Civil War, came home to marry his girlfriend, who showed up dead. Tom was blamed for the murder, though it was his girlfriend's cousin, who was jealous of the relationship, who killed her. However, she was in a high social position, and Tom took the blame and was hung. There's the basic story. Here's two different ballad versions.
<laughs> if you know, sing along. <laughs> oh, we will. <laughs> Okay, we'll stop short of the end of that one. I hope that's okay and there won't be a riot. <laughs> <laughs> a different version. There might also be some singing along for this one. This is Doc Watson rather than the Kingston Trio. Okay. I'm going to stop it there just so we get to talk about it instead of just hear the songs. So these are two different ballads, both addressing the same story, the same situa situation. And there are some common themes between the two that really help define the genre of a ballad. One of which is it cuts across high and low culture. This could be as appealing to an audience listening to a lecture at the Library of Congress, middle of the day on a Thursday, or it can be sung on a porch in the Appalachian Mountains of North Carolina. I've seen it and heard it in both places. <laughs> <laughs> so it cuts across these. It's still an appealing story regardless. And the music is familiar, potentially. Other parts of the genre are poetic, so it's appealing to listen to, sounds good, things rhyme. It's concise and episodic. So each of the verses, you had a different part of the story. Now you get more of the story in Doc Watson than you do in the Kingston Trio. Also, Doc Watson's has a peppier beat to it than the Kingston Trio, which goes slower and focuses more on the reiteration of the verse over and over again. You only get a line or two of the actual story each time through. And then that leads into another feature, which is the dense patterns of repetition and refrain. It's always gonna go between refrain, verse, refrain, verse, refrain, verse. It's the, 
refrain though that really brings it together. Hang your head, Tom Dooley. Hang your head, Tom Dooley. Hang your head, Tom Dooley. <laughs> All of that. What I really want to talk about with the ballets though is their relationship to time. They're speaking to a particular moment. So this ballad is addressing a story that happened hundreds of years ago. So why do we still play it? Why are Doc Watson and the Kingston Trio, at least 100 years later, bringing the song back up, recording it, and using it to get to the top of the pop charts, at least for the Kingston Trio, reach the top of the popular music chart? So the story and the music still stick in the head. It comes back again and again to where even the story, though the specifics are old, the idea of a love triangle and a murder, like you can t turn on the TV any night and you'll see some kind of story like that. It's appealing over and over and over again. So it is specifically set to one particular time but also can be recirculated and recirculated again and again throughout time. Uh, all right. They can circulate in large part early on because of cheap printing. So the, uh, <laughs> the broadside ballad came into popularity with the printing press. You could print a ton of them on a sheet, a half sheet of paper for not a lot of money. So with that circulation, that, pam that excuse me, papering of songs all over the place lets it be anonymous, but also recirculating that story. Sometimes it gets stripped of the author to the point that we can't tell who wrote some of these broadsides, while also still keeping that song alive. In some ways, it's the voice of the people. Vox Populi. So on to broadside specifically. No, no more Doc Watson, go away. <laughs> so broadsides for Red Ark are important because they are the voice of the people. It's everything from price of fish over to declarations, what's for sale, notes from one thing to another. It could be anything. And for the most part, paper is cheap. All you have to do is be literate in order to participate in that discussion. Now, paper itself, for the time period I'm talking about between the Declaration of Independence and inauguration of George Washington, paper gets to be expensive. In 1765, the Stamp Act was put into place. And though it was repealed a year later, as because it failed. Um, forging and foregoing a stamp on a document was a crime punishable by death, and the cost of a single sheet of paper included a tax equal to current day money of about $4.69. So every sheet of paper that you use, extra $5, please. And this was put into place to cover <coughs> the British cost of the Seven Years' War. You can see why it didn't go over particularly well and set off a lot of the revolution. And only a few states ever actually collected the stamp tax. But it also, as the war progressed, it raised that price of paper. Everything was difficult to get a hold of, especially when US currency may or may not be accepted, probably not. British pounds can be difficult to get a hold of. Other dimensions of broadsides that are worth noticing, they have often have ornamental designs of some sort, wood cutting illustrations that are for visual appeal. And some of these get used over and over and over again. They're a print communication to the masses, the just plain folks. They're created by and for everyday announcements and entertainment. The widespread nature of their printing and ephemeral exigence works against their preservation. How many of you guys keep the flyer that somebody hands to you on the street? <laughs> Sometimes. Usually it goes right in the trash. So these are documents that are created for a particular moment and then meant to be discarded. 
So the fact that we have any of them is rather special. So don't harp on those hoarders quite so much. <laughs> um, but it's very rare to find the same broadside in more than one archive. Usually when you come across one, it is unique in the full sense of that word. A lot of them are preserved in archives, such as this one, or saved in personal collections just by happenstance. The publicness of their posting subjectively er, subjects relatively fragile paper to weather, time, and discardment once the contents of the broadside are no longer exigent. Their entire rhetorical existence is as ephemera. But their rhetorical life grows from the fulfillment of an exigence until it gives way to the next one. Generally, they can be anything from criminal confessions to those fish costs, like I mentioned. And perhaps you're thinking about literacy at this time. How many people could actually read them? Historian Kenneth Lockridge estimates between 1758 and 1762, approximately 60% of white New England men were literate, with that raising to 85% between 1787 and 1795. So probably somewhere in the middle for this time period we're talking about. He also notes that literacy was much higher in New England and mid-Atlantic colonies than the South, and much higher in cities than rural environments, which probably is to be expected. It's impossible to find statistics for female literacy during this time, but Joel Perlman and Dennis Shirley estimate that half of white women born around 1730 were illiterate. But 80 years later, nearly all white women were literate. So we're in this time of transition, both for literacy and for the country as a whole. So some examples specifically. The Tory Act is itself a discussion. In anticipation of the war's coming, this May 1776 broadside, broadside preserved in the Library of Congress, right across the hall, uh, and it declares, whereas this assembly and their present session have made any preparations for defense against the increasing hostilities and efforts of our unnatural enemies, yet considering the alarming situation of the United Colonies, being threatened with the whole force is great, Britain united, with all such foreign mercenaries as they are able to engage, to assist the execution of their causeless vengeance on these devoted colonies. The broadside goes on to describe in depth the extent to which Brit British control could go in a war setting as a call to action. Burning and destroying our seaport towns and to spread uh, murder and destruction through the whole. In this situation, our utmost efforts can be too much, and it is the duty of every individual to contribute all in his power to serve and defend our most important cause. It goes on later. I'm reading this to you since there's no way you can read that print up there. <laughs> In this day of darkness and threatening calamity, it is most earnestly recommended to and pressed upon all persons of every rank and denomination in this colony to promote and cultivate charity and benevolence towards one another, to abstain from every species of extortion and oppression. It's a call by the author to rise above violence for violence's sake. This call to listen to their better angels is one they seriously intended by their appeal to good Christian virtue. Such a direct address to the citizens of Connecticut makes clear that the goal was not reunification with Great Britain. Not a chance in the world. The rupture of the whole, mentioned in the first half of the broadside, has not created halves, but rather two new wholes. Rather than having one seamless harmony that fits together, we instead have two separate harmonies. They cannot be reconciled as rhetorically situated in this broadside. The logical irreparation rifts, irreparable rifts, 
resonated again a century later in the Civil War and Reconstruction, and faintly echoed during the Civil Rights Movement of the 20th century. America's historic narrative is one that teeters between fractures and unity. A second broadside from this period, the sentiments of an American woman in which we hear the voice of a woman. We know that it was published January 10th, 1780 by Esther Reed, and it appeals to women's war support. They mention ambitions akin to heroines of antiquity, which is a mainstay of this, dis this time period's discourse. This was used to launch the Ladies' Association of Philadelphia. It ends with, let us not lose a moment. Let us be engaged to offer the homages of our gratitude at the altar of military valor. And you are brave deliverers, while mercenary slaves combat to cause you to share with them the irons with which they are loaded. Receive with a free hand our offering, the purest of which can be presented to your virtue. Their cause was one of war support. They were trying to raise funding, raise clothing, animals, whatever they could get their hands on to help support the military. And this is one of a couple of popular kinds of broadsides that are strictly argument. So their arguments to the Tories, illustrations of unity for fellow rebels, and ballads combining both. Often these broadsides borrow from other cultures to form a distinct identity. Broadsides became popular with the rise of printed culture, but the ballad links between oral and written. No oral culture survives in print, but a genre that thrives with the rise of print. So, these broadsheets, ballad sheets, stall ballads, slip songs, whatever they, they're called when they're addressing music. Encourage ballads to circulate both locally and transnationally. You have to work with both the sonic and the linguistic dimensions of the broadside ballad. So, we'll finally get to some broadsides. I've divided broadside ballads into a couple of themes that help us sort out what identity formations there are, how they're adjusted, and why they come about through these songs. So the first one is a new American people. And I say a new American people because this constitution of a United States of America citizen ignores the native indigenous people who have been here for centuries. So crafting a new identity is one that ignores that rich tradition. And I wish there was a way to recover that, but a lot of it was lost due to print culture. So this is the best I can do. So new American people, we have the industrious farmer and a song about his work, the American sailor and a song about his work. Not a particular person, but the archetypes that they inhabit. We have the industrious farmer in more detail that says, success unto the farmer and unto George our king. So this is one that predates, either predates the war or is put in circulation by a Tory. It's uncertain when exactly this was printed. We also have the beggar girl in the center, which I find fascinating that the lowest class citizen the child, who is also homeless, is given a song. Call me not lazy back, beggar, and bold enough. Fame would I learn both to knit and to sew. I have two little brothers at home. When they're old enough, they will work hard for their gifts you bestow. Pity kind gentlemen, etc. And then on the end, we have a new song called The Dear Maiden to Me made to me, which is about a woman, but not written by a woman. We'll come back to this in a minute. Others that are particularly surprising, 
as I was looking through these, include The Dying Slave, which clearly was not written by a slave. This was somebody taking on that persona and imagining, whether accurately or not, what that might be like. So the first verse there says, for many long years I have been a poor slave, but age draws me on apace. A cold piercing wind have I felt on the waves, no pleasure I've seen in my days. I am feeble and worn and have quite lost my strength. My day will not be many more. For death will a pace which shortens my breath while I, while I stand tugging at the oar. So this certainly was not written by somebody who was fond of slavery. But it gives a insight into what that experience might be like, even if it's imagined from the outside. It is bringing a different perspective on who these people are who are constituting this new nation. The one next to it pairs nicely, especially with contemporary discourse. The American immigrant discusses leaving your home behind, leaving that nation from which you come and making this the place not having that identity as connected to Scotland or Ireland, but being American and nothing else. <laughs> Our next section is one of lovely ladies lamenting. You laugh, it's true. <laughs> so in this section, we draw on contrast, in contrast to the sentiments of American women that was earlier. So in these, women are confined to very particular roles, usually lover, maiden, mourner, or wife. So in this, we have the lover, where she is complaining. These women in these broadside songs are often complaining. <laughs> Another trope that has yet still continued to this day. So we have the lover's complaint, the wandering maid, the mourning wife in this I guess, ballad at the gallows, and then the complaining wife. But it's the complaining wife. So on Celia's complaint, it's, the subtitle is, For the Loss of Her Shepherd Gone to Fight in America. So it's not just the wife, it's the wife who is also sacrificing while her spouse is at war. So she's dutiful. She is there doing her duty as well as the men who are fighting. But this is one compared to others. So a new song called The Dear Made to Me features this line, you celebrated muses exist my weak confusion. For her, I am uh, perusing my doleful misery. Of a maid that provided ungrateful, to me she has provided deceit, and I owe, I love her faithful. She is my, she is the dear maid, oh me. I pull this out to note the appeal to the muses, which is a staple in ancient discourse. So think of the Iliad, the Odyssey, they all start with, hear me, O oh muse, and bring it together. These appeals to the muse at the beginning not only honor that tradition, but also brings that lineage of literature from Greek, Rome, all of that into this new nation. It's a thread that they're intentionally pulling in. And there will be more on this later. And then, of course, the complaining woman, the unruly tongue. <laughs> if I could, I would marry again, but sadly, she just won't stop talking. <laughs> That's the sentiment. There's a lot more to it, but it's telling the story of a woman who won't stop talking. So the next category is war. As we move into this period, 1776, 1783, we are Revolutionary War all the way through. So this is one of the more popular songs that I couldn't find in broadside form, but we know would have circulated in that way. 
Ah. There we go. So we get a slightly different perspective on the war ballads here. Now this we should put in contrast with songs like To the Battlefield. This is a call to join the cause. And it brings in one of the features in these war ballads, and that is the good death. Participating in this war, becoming a soldier of the US even if you die in that fight to become a nation, it is considered the good death. You died for a cause. It was not lost. You didn't die in vain. It was just and right and good. So, we see that in this. We keep, we keep our spirits under, in proud disdain, we've broke again, and tore each link asunder, marched to the battlefield. You still march on, even when things are going poorly. Others, such as the American hero, tell the same story. And this tells the story of the Battle of Bunker Hill and the burning of Charleston. I won't play it the whole way through, but it should help you hear how it goes. This is a shape note version of the song. You get the idea. Nope, stop that. <laughs> you get the idea. This is 
in the spirit of almost a dirge dragging forward as a way to bolster the troops. We are not quite dead yet. Though it might come soon. At least it will be the good death. Others include the Liberty Song, the Massachusetts Song on Liberty. So these are used for these groups like the Sons of Liberty to really rally around as their sonic contribution to the war effort. It's a way of making heard what may not be seen. So these groups that hide or don't want to have their identity shown, you can sing as a way of still having that collective identity. And then there are others, March to the Battlefield, a song made on the evacuation of the town of Boston. All of these big events early in the revolution became in song form as a way of rallying those to the cause and continuing that spirit of revolt. We also have the immigrants' farewell to their native country as a further reinforcing this freedom, this idea of what this country lends us that others don't. And then the loyal soldier, where it again brings together the good death. Others include the loss of one hero. Again, the good death, this mournful song. And then one specifically addressing the death of Abercrombie prominent figure in the revolution. The last category I want to talk about is revising British culture. So all of these broadsides up to this point have attempted to separate the notion of British culture from the revolution. We're not them. We are our own. Like Dividing those two harmonic lines into something that cannot be resolved. Yet, Many of the broadsides in ballot form rely on British ideas, British song, an origin point that rather than abandoning completely, they choose to rewrite. So we have Rule, Britan Rule Britan Brit apologies. Britannia, <laughs> there it is, which I'll play a tiny bit of. Sound familiar? Nope, pause. All right, you'll notice down in verse six, it also starts with the muses. So we're back to that lineage, going back to Greek and Rome. Let's be continuing this legacy of these high cultures. And there's also the figurehead of Britannia. This is the nation embodied in a single figure. So what do we do for the US? We have Columbia and right, hail Columbia.
we'll stop it there. So some things to note in this version. First, this is the vice president's entrance song. It was the president's up until uh, Polk, whose wife thought that this was not a grand enough entrance and <laughs> made Hail to the Chief. It's of note, Polk was a very short president, so he didn't make exactly a grand <laughs> statement when entering a room. He was not George Washington with 6'4". No, he was probably about my size, which can be for a little more subtle entrance to a room. So <laughs> Hail to the Chief instead of Hail Columbia. So this is now the vice president's song. It may have been considered for the national anthem if it were not for Uncle Sam becoming the figurehead instead of Columbia. So there are some items that put the two together, but it's a very brief period of time before Uncle Sam becomes the figurehead and Columbia diminishes. With her diminishment, it became the vice president's song and was not as prominent of a figure that we identified with. So occasionally you'll see images of her, but usually in statue form not drawn as a personification of America. There we go. Another one, a new song. Such a creative title. To, to the tune of the British Grenadiers, which if you don't know it already, you will recognize it within seconds of me hitting play. Well, assuming I can hit play. Okay, no, stop that. <sighs> so one thing to note, they use the same melody. It's a marching tune, so it's one that keeps everybody in step going forward together. But where it was hail to the king at the end, it is now for war in Washington. Take out the king, put in Washington. And this was before we figured out like what we were going to call the president. Were we even going to have a president? Would he be called your excellency? what would be going on. So take out the king, put in Washington as the central figurehead around which we can all identify with and come together under his leadership. So everything is for Washington. Everything, everything, everything. And freedom is put in quite a bit. There's also mentions of Hancock and um, Madison further down in the song, but every single verse. Washington, 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 Washington. <laughs> all right, and then the last one, which perhaps, well, all of you are familiar with is Yankee Doodle. But you may not be aware of the full history of Yankee Doodle. Yankee Doodle was written during the French and Indian War as a satire by a British Army physician, Dr. Richard Shuckberg. It was written to mock New Englanders. And once it was written down on paper, the directions for how to sing it were through the nose in a West Country drawl and dialect. <laughs> the lyrics were even less complimentary, including Seth's mother went to Lynn to buy a pair of breeches. The first time they then put them on, he tore all the, st the stitches. Dolly Butchell led a fart. Jenny Jones, she found it. Ambrose carried it to the mill where Dr. Warren grabbed it. This is what they thought of. Americans, or at least the colonists. So the song was not complimentary of the colonies, and it was taken as a grave insult. So when the British Army came to the colonies to fight the revolution, they sang it all the time to make fun of the colonists and the Continental Army. But after Lexington, suddenly the song didn't seem like quite quite an insult anymore. We'll take it and sing it back to the British, except we'll change the lyrics just a little bit sit and make it our own. So what was initially offensive became a way of like, yeah, this is our song now. We've got it. You tried to shame us with it, but we're not going to allow it. Uh, da, da, da. And there were a couple different variations of it. The lyrics that we know now, and you're taught in like 
elementary school have evolved over time. So one of the variations was father and son return from a visit to camp. So father and I went down to camp along with Captain Gooding. I'm not going to sing any more than that <laughs> for obvious reasons. Um, but there are parts in here that are meant to mock the British back. Uh, especially uh, stuck a feather in his cap and called it macaroni. That line that kids ask their parents about, like, what the heck does that mean? It's re a reference to the Macaroni Club in London, which is a like very high society, like, you have to be dressed super nice to get in there, members only kind of establishment. And when it was in the British version, it was meant to mock the awful dress of the colonists, especially the Continental Army, who just had whatever you could, put it together, and that's a uniform. <sighs> but then it's, yeah, we're a ragtag group of people, but we're still kicking your ass. <laughs> <laughs> so that, which originally offends, is then turned and used as am ammunition, but verbal ammunition against the colonists, or against the British, apologies. So, what do we do with all this? I've shown you a lot of broadsides and talked through these themes. So, the ballad is a unique place to tell stories about ourselves and about where we came from. It's a way to see who we are and who we want to be. So we are the stories that we tell about ourselves. Harmonies take place over time. This version of America in these just handful of years is rhetorically crafted and it changes. We are not the same people now as a nation that we were then, not just geographically, but also identity wise. And all of that is constructed. It's something that we put together through discourse and a very small part of it comes through songs. Thank you. just so we can make sure that everybody uh, is able to leave on time. So uh, if you have questions for Carolyn, please. I'll do what I can. When I look at broadsides, I'm often fascinated by what melodies they chose. Yes. I think about the songs that I know best if I want to pick a tune, and I think that says something about who I am. Mm -hmm. And so I think the tunes that they pick say something about them. And Absolutely. I'm wondering if you had any insights about that after looking at so many broadsides. So I've done quite a bit of tracing, like what the melodies are, because some of them, like, I don't know. I have to go figure out what it is. Sometimes you can't even figure it out anymore. But in writing, most often, they are drinking songs. Yeah. Either drinking songs or songs from church. So that's a nice... And in fact... Well, when I was looking through the hymnals for my Battle Hymn of the Republic project, there are a lot of hymns that come from drinking songs. That's what Charles Wesley did. He was like, well, let's take songs they already know from being at the bar and bring them into church. That's at least what they tried to do. Yeah? I thought that most of these were what we would call broadside ballads or, uh, or um, a penny ballads. Mm -hmm. Were not given away. They were actually sold. And they were often sold on clothes lines, mm -hmm. up like New York City Hall, up at a fence around people. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it, it's not like these were being distributed. Uh, your point about how much paper costs, uh, I was, uh, I'm a little confused because that really has, people were buying these. In a, lot, right? in a lot of the ones that I found in the archive, at the bottom it says, if you are interested in buying the sheet music for this, e like, not email us, but like, mm -hmm. here's our address. Send us this much of a fee. So it was an advertisement. We give you the lyrics, but we'll hold on to the music in cases where the melody was not already known. So the ones that were known already, it was those penny. Oh. But that can become more expensive I, over I, time. I, 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 we should talk afterwards. Okay. I, I think I'm not sure about that. Okay. So I have a question. Where, mm -hmm. uh, where would these songs be sung? Like, where's the, where's sort of the location 
for or the environment for this type of music? Is it just like anywhere? <laughs> uh, anywhere, if done individually, a lot of these were, especially the war and British varieties, were used just marching tunes for the army to, you know, everybody gets in the same step and you go. Any other questions? All right, there we go. <laughs> you said that in some cases the melody didn't survive, was not unknown? As far as I've been able to find, they haven't. It may be that somebody else knows it, um, but has not made it accessible, as far as I've been able to track. Hmm? So the ones where Americans are taking a song from the British and rewording it, or mm -hmm. vice versa. Is that a deliberate thing? Like that's a popular song, so it's kind of like up yours by turning it back into this new thing? Mm -hmm. or, or was it also common because maybe there weren't a lot of tunes that everybody knew, so you choose? Mm -hmm. Yeah. That way everybody's included? I think it's a little bit of both. Okay. It's a, everybody knows this song. It's a good one to march to or to get everybody going, but I really don't like those words. So let's change it. Why not? And it doesn't take a whole lot to learn new words to the same song. Right, because you know the melody. You know the melody. You put new words to it and change the meaning of it change what circumstances it can be used in. So the melodies are a lot more versatile than the lyrics. And oftentimes the melody can be associated with hundreds of songs. Yeah. yeah. So, so obviously there weren't copyrights. <laughs> there was no copyright. <laughs> no. No, I don't, I'm not sure when copyright comes into the question, but. <laughs> 1790. <laughs> Thank you. So seven years after the end of my time frame for this. <laughs> yes. All right. Let's go ahead and thank.